I think a lot of people these days make more mistakes than they will, will admit. I don't know about you, but I've run into a lot of people who act like they're practically perfect in every way. It kind of reminds me of Mary Poppins. Remember oh, Mary, yeah. Mary Poppins? She was practically perfect in every way. So I want to share some thoughts with you, but really stick with two stories most of the time. I want to share a story about a guy in the Old Testament uh, that knew better, and I want to share a guy in the, uh, in the New, New Testament. A guy in the Old Testament was Lot, the New Testament was the prodigal son who knew better, but yet had the courage to make a U-turn. Mm. There's a big difference between those who don't make a U-turn and those who do make a U-turn, right? Amen. Uh, Philip Yancey said one time, God is not a blurry power living somewhere in the sky, not an abstraction like the Greeks thought, not a sensual superhuman like the Romans thought, and definitely not the absentee watchmaker of the deists. He says, God is personal. He enters into people's lives, messes with families, calls people to account. Most of all, God loves. God's personal is the point he's trying to, trying to talk about. Turn, if you will, over to Genesis chapter 13. I want to share a story with you that I haven't shared uh, in this church for some time. And I'm going to share it from the message paraphrase, which kind of puts it in a little different light. Genesis chapter 13 uh, starting in verse number 1. Again, Genesis chapter 13, starting in verse number 1. So Abram left Egypt and went back to the Negev, he and his wife and everything he owned. And Lot was still with them. By now Abraham was very rich, loaded with cattle and silver and gold. He moved out on from the Negev, camping along the way to Bethel to place the place he had first set up his tent between Bethel and Ai and built his first altar. Abram prayed there to God. Verse 5 says, Lot, who was traveling with Abram, was also rich in sheep and cattle and tents. So Lot was not just a guy uh, sponging off of Abram. He had his own wealth. But the land couldn't support both of them. They had too many possessions. They couldn't both live there. Quarrels broke out between Abram shepherds and Lot shepherds. The Canaanites and Perizzites were also living on the land at the same time. So there was quite a few people trying to get to the same place. Verse 8. Abram said to Lot, let's not have fighting between us, between your shepherds and my shepherds. After all, we're family. Look around. Isn't there plenty of land out there? Let's separate. If you go left, I'll go right. If you go right, I'll go left. So in verse 10, it says, Lot looked, he saw the whole plain of the Jordan spread out, well watered. This is, was before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like God's garden, like Egypt, and stretching out all the way to Zoar. Lot took the whole plain of the Jordan. Lot set out to the east. Verse 11. That's how they came to part company, uncle and nephew. Abram settled in Canaan. Lot settled in the, in the, the towns between, or in the plain pitched near Sodom. But the people, in verse 13, the people of Sodom were evil. This paraphrase says, flagrant sinners against God. Mm. Now, my question for, I think, us here today is, did, did Lot know this? Did Lot know that the people in that town, in that city, were flagrant sinners? He saw, Lot saw the fertile land and may have ignored the obvious about Sodom. How many of us, over time and over our lives, have ignored the obvious because we wanted what we wanted. I think every human being has gone through that place. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go to Genesis chapter 18 in the New Living Translation, I want to switch it up on you just, just a tad bit. Genesis 18, starting in verse number 20. It says, So the Lord told Abraham, I have heard a great outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah, because their sin is so flagrant. I'm going down to see if their actions are as wicked as I have heard. If not, I want to know. The other men turned and headed towards Sodom, but the Lord remained with Abraham. Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away both the righteous and the wicked? Suppose you find 50 righteous people living there in that city. Will you still sweep it away and not spare it for your sakes? For their sakes, excuse me? Verse 25. Surely you wouldn't do such a thing, destroy the, the righteous along with the wicked? Why would you be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same? 
Surely he wouldn't do that. Surely should not the judge of the earth do what is right? So in verse 26, it says, And the Lord replied, If I find 50 people in Sodom, I will spare the entire city for their sake. Then Abraham spoke again, Since I have begun, let me speak further to my Lord, even though I am but dust and ashes. Suppose there are only 45 righteous people rather than 50. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And the Lord said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 righteous people there. Abraham was pleading for these people. Verse 29, then Abraham pressed further. Suppose there are only 40. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 40. And the Lord, and, uh, excuse me, verse 30, but please don't be angry, my Lord. And Abraham pleaded, let me speak. So suppose only 30 righteous people are found. Abraham knew what he was doing. Abraham knew that there, it, it would be a long shot if there were 30 people there. But he was trying to make a difference in the people's lives. Mm -hmm. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it if I find 30. Then Abraham said in verse 31, since I, have, since I have dared to speak to the Lord, let me continue. Suppose there's only 20. How low can he go, right? Get down to, to 20 people. And the Lord replied, then I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Now this, this if I might pause this story momentarily, this gives me a lot of understanding how important intercessory prayer really is. Mm -hmm. To get between people that are knuckleheads, if you will, yeah. and God's, God's way for, for them. There's, it's such an important, vital role to have intercessory <laughs> prayer, people that will go to bat for people that don't know any better. So in verse 32, it says, Finally Abraham said, Lord, please don't be angry with me if I speak one more time. Supp suppose there's only 10. He gets what, from 50 <laughs> down, to, down to 10? Oh my. Suppose only 10 are found there. And the Lord replied, listen, it goes down to 10. Can God change his mind? Based on this story, I say yes. Then I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. When, Abra when the Lord had finished, this is verse 33, when the Lord had finished his conversation with Abraham, he went on his way, and Abraham returned to his ten. If you, if you jump forward a bit in, Psalm, rather, in Genesis 19.1, it says, Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot, listen, as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. He was comfortable. He, he made his home. He went from having his tent outside of that town, remember, and now he's in the town in Genesis chapter 19.1. So when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to, to the ground. This is where a lot of business took place. So Lot not only was, was a guest, but he, he has now evolved from a guest to a resident of this, this town, whereby he was influential in several different ways, some, some folks say. In, 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 uh, in chapter 19, verse 2, the New American Standard says, I know I'm jumping tra tra translations on you, but it says in Genesis 19, 2, and he said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house. I'm sharing this story. I think it's an important story to share today. Please turn aside into your servant's house, and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. In that culture, it was very important to take care of the guests that came into a certain town or into your home. They said, no, but we shall spend the night in the square. Verse 3. Yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house and, and prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Verse 4. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the, the, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, this is important, both young and old, all the people from every corner of this town. Verse 5, and, and they called to Lot and said to them, where are the men who came to you to tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. Verse 6, but Lot went out to them in the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. This is very interesting. Please, my brothers. The, these, Lot knew these guys, and these guys knew Lot. Lot was, no, again, I'm repeating, but Lot was no stranger. Verse 7, and he said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Now, behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with men. Please let me bring them out to you, and you do whatever you like. So in that culture, obviously, as you know, women and girls were property. They weren't real human beings. So they would rather put their daughters out there than, than disrespect a stranger in a person's town. A whole different cultural Amen. norm than what I'm used to. Verse 9, 
But they said, stand aside furthermore. This one came in as an alien and already is acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door, verse 10. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot to the house with them and shut the door. You with me? They stuck the men who were in, at the doorway in the house with blindness, both great and small, uh, so that they were so they weary themselves trying to find the doorway. You can only, I think, push God so far. And then God says, eventually, enough is enough. I don't want to get anywhere near that zip code where Amen. God says, enough is enough. Verse twelve. Then the two men said to Lot, "Whom, uh, whom else have you here? A son-in-law and your sons and your daughters, and whomever you have have to leave the city." Bring them out of this place. Verse 13. For we, are, for we are about to destroy this place, because their outcry has become so great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were uh, to marry his daughters and said, Up, get up out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared uh, to his sons-in-law to be just jesting. They, they thought he was yanking their chain. They thought that they were kidding I can't help believe that America hasn't been judged yet because of the faithful few in comparison to the, uh, to the volume of people that are doing evil every day in God's eyes. I do believe that without the church, without believers constantly crying out to God for mercy, then this country would be in much deeper weeds than it is right now. So in verse 15... Uh, again, this is a purpose to this story. I, I, I normally don't read a long story like this, but I believe there is a reason for it here today. So in verse 15 says, When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who were here, and you will be, or you will be slept, swept away in the punishment of this city. But he, he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife, and the hands of his two daughters, for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. For the compassion of the Lord was upon him. God is a long-suffering God. He will, he will go to the, the nth degree to make a difference in people's lives, right? And they brought him out and put him out of the city. So again, Lot was hesitating. Lot was comfortable. Lot didn't want to go, even though all these signs were right there and obvious saying that you have to go. How many times, don't raise your hands, haven't we been knuckleheaded with God? When God makes things very, very clear in our path, and we choose not to go that way. So in verse 17, it says, When they brought them outside, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, All know, my lords, now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, for the disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Now behold, the town is near enough to flee to. It is small. Please let me escape to this little town, so my life is saved. He said to them, Behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town in which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until uh, you arrive there. And therefore, the name of the town was called Zoar. Now, the story gets worse, and we're going to pause there and not go there. But in, starting in verse 30 down to number 38, it got worse. It got really bad, really bad. And I'll just leave it at that, which you can read there on your own. It just got really bad. Now, we know, based on Scripture, that a, a, a result... Of verse 30 to 38, the, the Moabites and the Ammonites came to power in time, which were a severe thorn in the side of God's chosen people. Mm -hmm. So uh, many people don't get, and I, I think a lot of us haven't gotten there before or haven't dealt with this before, that sometimes we don't know the repercussions of our actions until it's way after the fact. Mm -hmm. And all of us have been there, not just, yeah. not just a few of us. Lot chose to go live with those who were not part of his upbringing. How many times have we chose to hang around people that, that dragged us down? It, it cost him his wife, Genesis 19.26. Lot knew better. We all know better, but sometimes we put on those blinders because we want to do what we want to do. Have you ever been there? that you, You've done stuff because you wanted to do stuff regardless? Jack Hayfer said one time, he says, you and I can help decide which of these two things, blessing or cursing, when, this, when either of these happen on earth. We will determine whether God's goodness is released 
towards specific situations or whether the power of sin and Satan is permitted to prevail. Prayer is the determining factor. One other author said, history belongs to the intercessors. I like that. History belongs to the intercessors. So often we can't go back and undo foolish things. I don't know about you, but if anybody knew the number of foolish things I've done in my life, I could never stand in front of people again. I've done so many foolish, stupid, stupid things. And I would dare to say that many of you have done some very, very foolish things that you are horribly ashamed of that you wouldn't want to show your face in public either. If you turn over to the New Testament, we, we just read about Lot, how Lot was forced to make a turnaround. He didn't, he didn't go willingly, by the way. We, we, we read, read that in Scripture. If you go to Luke chapter 15 in the New Living Translation, it puts it in a, in a different kind of way. Luke 15, um, starting in verse number 11. It says, Jesus told this story, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So, the, so his father agreed to divide his wealth between his two sons. Verse 13 says, a few days later, his younger son packed up all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a, a local farmer to hire him. The man sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. Verse 17. This is, this is the turning point of this young man's life. And by the way, we've all had these turning points in our lives. I would dare say, I would dare guess, multiple times in our lives. Verse 17. But when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, even, even at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned both against heaven and against you. For I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. This is such a great story of how God treats his kids, you know. He takes us back and says, a servant? You're your family. You're my son. You're my daughter. That's just totally awesome. Verse 20 says, So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him come, and filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son, his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, for I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I would dare say, if I might pause, that we are no longer and have not been worthy for God to call us his kids or us to call God Heavenly Father. But Jesus Christ came to the planet to bridge that gap. And that I cannot get out of my mind. Right. In verse 22, But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals on his feet. So the son, listen, the son took ownership and his mistakes and he made an attempt to make it right. I've told this example in church many times that some people don't know that they don't know. Lot didn't know that he didn't know, I guess. In fact, I question that. Because Lot moved from the tent in the field to the city with the sin. But there are other people who knew that they didn't know. Maybe they, were, maybe they evolved from not knowing that they didn't know to knowing that they didn't know. And then the 180 happens. They turn around. Us guys tend to be that, that way more so, I think, than ladies. That we are kind of knuckleheaded on turning around because of our ego, because of our pride. Right? The, the son in this story owned his mistake. Aaron DeCamp says, admitting your mistakes, listen, is not a sign of weakness. It shows you have courage to know you're wrong and that you have become stronger. The great jazz musician Miles Davis said, he says, when you hit a wrong note, it's the net, excuse me, he said, when you hit a wrong note, it's the next note that makes it good or bad. Amen. Mm -hmm. Miles Davis again. <laughs> when you hit 
a wrong note. It's the next note that makes it good or bad. I can remember when I was learning how to play the uh, piano and organ that my, my teachers would, would tell me, because I was always wincing. I would, Ooh, I had a flat instead of a sharp or whatever. I, I'd make this funny face, but she, she, she would tell me over and over again, John, they don't know that you messed up until you make this you know, gesture that you messed up. It doesn't matter. You mess up, you fix it, you keep going. What's the big deal, right? And another guy who lived in the 1800s, he says, the greatest mistake you can make in life is to be continually afraid you're going to make one. To be continually afraid you're going to make one. Guess what? You're going to make a bunch, not just one. That's for sure. The great Johnny Cash said, you build, listen, you build on failure. Use it as a stepping stone. Close the door of the past. You don't try to forget the mistakes, but you don't dwell on it either. You don't let it have any of your energy or any of your time, listen, or any of your space. Les Brown said, Forgive yourself for your faults and your mistakes and move on. If there's, any, if there's any difficulty that I've had over the years is me forgetting and forgiving me for stupidity. Whereas God has forgiven us a long time ago. So maybe it's up to us to let it go. Let, it, let the past be in the past and move on, move forward, right? The prodigal son in, in Luke realized that he goofed and he made an attempt to fix it. That's, that's a huge step because there's some people out there that are, are let's just say, I'm trying to be kind, that, that don't make an attempt to, to fix it. They don't make an attempt to make it right. One, one, one author said, courageous leaders don't make excuses, they apologize. I like that. Courageous leaders don't make excuses, they apologize. The great prophet Bruce Lee said, mistakes are always forgivable if one has the courage to admit them. That, that's huge, isn't it? To, to, to admit that, you know what, I messed up and then tell people I messed up. That, that, that's a big deal. Because you know what, I've, I've learned in my old life of 46 years that God will get, that God and human beings, by the way, will give you so much more grace when you said, I messed up. Instead of being a knucklehead and saying, you know what, I, I'm not admitting I messed up. When everybody on the planet knows that you, you messed up. Thank God I've had people in my life that were gracious to me. They said, John, I know you messed up. I, I can remember giving you a quick story. Back in 1984, I worked for Photo First. And that store was, called, was spelled F-O-T-O, Photo First in Columbia Mall. I was uh, 18 years old. And I worked at a photo lab. They sold cameras uh, there, film, and more importantly, processing pictures, uh, where, where they used chemicals and not digital. So we're talking 1800s time. You know, we're talking a long time ago. So, there, and I had to you know, uh, go to the cash register and take care of people there and, and take in film and things. So there were many times when we had to uh, fill up the ch chemical trays underneath the, um, the printers to get more chemicals in there to process the photographs, right? So I can't tell you how many times I was stupid enough to do this, but my boss, Sharon, would always tell me, John, if you have to go out front to help a customer out front, make sure that you turn off the tanks that you're filling up with the chemicals because you're, you're not going to remember because time flies really fast out front and you're getting involved with the customer and then you start smelling something and you realize that chemicals are all over the floor because it overflowed. It happened to me, I know, in a year and a half, I was there 10 times, 8 times, 12 times, I ran dumb. And I'd have to clean it all up and inhale all this horrible fixer and developers and all this stuff and walk in stuff and eat up my shoes. and It, it was nasty stuff. But you know why it happened? Because I didn't take her advice because she was the boss and knew what she was talking about. Then I ended up not only making a mess, but costing the company money that I wasn't even thinking about at age 18. I was thinking about my, my stupidity. How many times have we done stuff stupid that everybody else sees that, that, have, that they give us a lot of grace? In fact, just in the last mm, two months, I, 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 I made a post on, on Facebook about this, this boss I had named, named, named Sharon, how gracious she was to me, that she could have very easily slammed me over and over and over, but she knew that I didn't know that I didn't know. You all with me? There's always advantages to admitting you're wrong. I, I read a story one time about a doctor who messed up in surgery. He royally messed up in, in, in surgery. 
So he understood that there was just a matter of time before the uh, patient was going to sue this doctor because of his mistake. And I can't remember the details of, of, of the error. But I do know that he just simply scheduled an appointment with the patient and just apologized. And said, you know, I messed up. I'd like to fix it. I know how to fix it. I messed up. And everything was fine. The patient got it. The patient understood that, you know what, mistakes happen. And the, 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 the apology turned that whole tone of that situation on its head. Bob Parsley says that when we admit mistakes, he says only secure, listen, this is important, only secure and confident people are strong enough to admit their mistakes. Only strong and confident people. And also he says that, that insecure people insist on being right all the time. Insecure people. The moment they admit their mistakes and rectify it, they learn from it and their character is built. Have you ever done something that you know you shouldn't have done? Now, I'm not talking sin, but something that, that, that you've pushed yourself to do because you thought you could do it because other people were doing it. And then you realized you fell on your face and realized that you shouldn't do that again. Hello? He says, another, Bob uh, Brian Parsley also says that admitting you're wrong also brings out a sterling reputation. Because people get it. Pe he people get that when you admit your mistakes, you realize that you're wrong, so what? Move on. You goofed, okay? Life doesn't end. And, and then also he says that it also increases your reputation. It, which is interesting. Because sometimes we, we expect ourselves to be perfect all the time. Yes, I'm striving to be perfect, but I'm way, way, way far from being perfect. But Tammy, that's another story. No, she's just, oh no, she's just, no, not practically perfect in every way. No, 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 no. But it's, it's very tempting, very tempting to get under this, this load, this guilt load of trying to be perfect when God has forgiven the imperfections in us as long as we continue to surrender our life to him. Misconception that when you tell people you goof, they won't trust you anymore. The opposite is really reality. People will trust you more because they know you're willing to tell the truth whether it's in your favor or not. So as I close and we go to part B of this service, some decisions are difficult and costly. The key is to turn around when you're realizing you're heading down the wrong road. And my kids can tell me and can ver verify that there's been several times when I've been heading down the wrong road and didn't want to turn around because my pride was too big. Tammy, has, uh, we've gone down the road many times because I've been trying to take shortcuts to get places and they ended up being long cuts. <laughs> They're not shortcuts at all. So now the older I get, because I know what she's going to say, why don't we just go down the, the regular path? I, since I don't want to hear it, I just stay on the road that, that, that we're used to and, and then I'll experiment on my own time. There you go. Anybody else going to get in well or an ouch or something or other? Hi, I'm John Carver, host of The John Carver Show. For a while now, you've heard me teaching from the Bible and from my life experiences. I'm the pastor of Faith Outreach Chapel in Baltimore, Maryland. These programs are reaching thousands and thousands of people each and every month in the United States, as well as several countries around the world. If my little sermons have helped you, please consider making regular tax-deductible donations to Faith Outreach Chapel. 1713 Ritson House Avenue, Baltimore, Maryland, 21227. That's 1713 Ritten House, R I T T E N H O U S E Avenue, Baltimore, Maryland, 21227. This way we can continue to make a difference in the lives of people and do more for those who need encouragement and guidance for their lives. Again, Faith Outreach Chapel, 1713 Ritten House Avenue, Baltimore, Maryland, 